Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Russell. Hi, Russell. Um, I'm a student with Cameron and Dan. I'm a hash. I got my hashes. Um, I'm going to talk about rhythmic microtiming. Um, I've been working on my master's thesis, which um, I think rhythm. Oh, let's talk about microtiming. Is um, microtiming is when you are sequencing things, not having it perfectly aligned to a grid, um, actually having fluctuations on individual event by event rhythm. So not having like some kind of swing pattern. Actually, each note can be moved slightly. Um, in it's usually, or it can be tempo dependent, so when it speeds up, you get less micro rhythm and it becomes more snapped, or when you slow down, it becomes much more uh, fluctuated. Um, a big issue is it's perceivable, you can hear it in a lot of rhythmic based music, but it's super difficult to notate it uh, using traditional notation, which we'll touch upon. Um, so, what we're going to look at uh, how rhythm is notated now using conventional notation, how that's evolved, the issues with it, how it's influenced common music, software, and then we'll go into an alternate approach to look at rhythm, um, which will go to my software that I'm working on to basically compose using an alternate system. Uh, and then we'll talk about programming rhythm and some alternatives to how to control layers of rhythm, uh, and then I'll play a bit. My master's thesis is super not done. It's not due until the end of August, and I'm still on the micro part. I still have to work on the macro part to control multiple micro parts. Uh, but it sounds good. For Go Coach Craig. So and then, yeah, you'll hear a bit of that. So, our current rotation this is jazz uh, snare drum comping pattern exercises. So, you see the triplets on the top are. That's where the snare would be practicing triplets. But even like triplets, this is if it's jazz, it's supposed to be swung in a specific pattern, and different drummers will move things back and forth depending on what type of jazz music it is, because there's not just jazz, there's so many subgenres and whatever. This notation system just does not, it will never be able to, you're always going to be locked into a grid. Um, which is fine if you're reading it and that's what people actually want, but even classical musicians will tell you that they don't, they don't actually play it exactly as it's written, and it's the interpretation that is so difficult. Um, and, but where does this notation come from? Um, some people don't know the, the origins of written Western notation comes from the, the earliest form is Gregorian chant, uh, which originally looked like this. Uh, if you see, there's no actual rhythmic notation. It was all lyric-based. Um, you get these little things would be melismas and stuff. So actually, like, and it's read left to right because Latin is read left to right. Um, so the rhythm came later. Uh, and I was listening, I got into this stuff for a bit, uh, and I saw a performance down at the St. Paul Church in London. And really, when you hear church music sung, you realize, there's so much reverb in churches that there would be no real, you wouldn't even be able to hear tiny micro differences in rhythm. It all would just be a wash. So compared to African music where everything is outside and like you wouldn't be performing that indoors or in these large resonant things, I think they just didn't, didn't bother with rhythmic notation being so precise. Which is cool, uh, except that it now when you were trying to notate more rhythmic things, you find pitfalls. Uh, there's a little bit of how much complexity you can do. Uh, you just can't read certain rhythmic patterns at very high tempos on the first go, and some of them are just impossible to be read by humans. Uh, it's, it's difficult to even see patterns when you're analyzing rhythmic uh, structures, which we'll talk about later. And when you're writing for electronic instruments, notation systems, Conventional notation systems are really, they just, they don't work. There's no, there's no system for opening a filter that we would read on. There's nothing for uh, a band pass filter versus a low pass filter. There could be, but we just haven't, like, we haven't agreed on one. Um, so I, I found that these bias are built into, the programmers who built popular DAWs are building them for people who use conventional notation. So built into DAWs, I've found, uh, and some of my colleagues and my professors, that these bias are built into these things. So, you know, the same process of going left to right, even waveform editing goes from left to right, 
um, which sound doesn't go left to right, it does circles around, but we still are editing it left to right, and we're looking at it left to right. Um, uh, and the GUIs in which the graphic user interfaces in which we're using are based on the notational system, like even MIDI, representing pitch up and down. That's not even necessarily how uh, our brains perceive it, more in a spiral where uh, one C is the same as the next C, so why don't we see that? I'm not going to talk about pitch, but there is a whole other element. I'm just going to talk about rhythm for this, uh, this project. Now, Ableton Live fixes some things by, there is a more looping function, but uh, in general, it still is going now instead of left to right, it goes up and down also. But we're still we're still stuck in this linear linearity, which you would have to be in if when you're looking at things and trying to understand them on first go. But yeah, I'll talk about alternatives to that. So um, in jazz music, we have you know a notation system where. It still is pretty much the same when you're reading melodies. There is lots of rhythmic interpretation. Any good jazz musician would not play. Doo, 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 doo. They would like totally improvise and play beats forward and back. Uh, and the chords are built for improvising. But in general, it's still right, left, to right. You have these little symbols which mean repeat, and then you have to go all the way back there. And this, oh, there's even a second one there. So you're like, what am I supposed to do here? Um, and there's people like. Cardu, who have written their own notation system, and there's a tiny dictionary beforehand where you have to, you know, oh, if you have a black circle, this means this, and if it's part of it is taken out, that represents this. Um, and for some people, it kind of looks, it's really scary and confusing if you have to, like, go, and this is pretty, like, first sight reading, and you get something like this, it's, it's frightening. <laughs> but it's not bad. Uh, I think it's a, a step in the right direction. And really, I'm just going to second Cameron in that. What I'm showing you is like, this is what I'm using, but there really is no right answer, which is quite beautiful, I think, and especially in visual music. Uh, Negro Fonte, um, who I, I like a lot, um, he wrote, in a post-information age, we often have an audience the size of one. Everything is made to order, and information is extremely personalized. And being digital, I am me, not a statistical subset. So he wrote that in 1995. And I think it's still coming true more and more that we have software that is more custom to the way that we think as individuals and as far as music and composition and aesthetic qualities go, we should be able to program our own stuff and not just have to use what has come before. Everything should be more individualized. Um, so now I'm going to talk about a, a circular approach. This was first introduced to me by Justin London. Uh, this stumbled upon his book in a library. Uh, but he still, uh, there's a lot of guys who use this representation for 12 tone music theory. And he took it and applied it to, uh, to contemporary, but really it's all music. So now instead of having a bar, as we saw before, um, where there's four beats in a bar, and then we repeat back four beats in a bar. He's taken subdivisions uh, and made small subdivisions of points on a circle. So instead of having it going left to right and back to left, when you're reading a circle, you don't have to jump at all. It just comes back to where you started. So if you can adjust the way you think uh, and see these two spaces, the smallest space being an eighth note, and you see it as a quarter note now, you can really see that like this will be back on itself. Just good for more uh, circular rhythms in percussion parts for stuff like electronic dance music and techno and rock. Um, and another thing that is really good. Oh yeah, that's right. Well, I guess we won't hear it. But when you do odd time signatures, it's not that much more complicated to to conceptualize. Because now instead of being this is blue rondo all the turf. So instead of being like I mean, for me, I just see one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. It's, it's my, I found it to be very helpful when I'm analyzing really complicated time signatures because I can see all the little subdivisions inside of them and it all comes together. And from a compositional standpoint, it's really, it's really great. It, this is a sewn clave pattern, um, which when you have the original, you know. 
This is this first one. Uh, you can just rotate it really easily in this notation. So now you have, because there's only five notes in that, you have five different patterns which are totally different and they feel completely different, but they're all essentially the same material. And to see that written out, it's incredibly complicated to see if even that that's the same rhythm. Um, so it's great to have more material out of less material, if you want. Um, and you can play around with those concepts also. Um, and uh, I haven't studied world music as much as some of my colleagues, but uh, another big factor in the circle theory is that a lot of popular rhythms like the tresillo um, are actually, uh, if you have four notes, okay, so you have the circle, we've accepted the circle. If you have eight events happening, and you, divide, and you put four events and you want to space them evenly on eight, then you have every other note, right? So you basically have one, two, three, four, if you want to put four. But if you have three events that are happening, it wouldn't fit perfectly if you like this triangle thing. Um, but when you just round to the nearest one, you actually get these very common rhythms in world music. Uh, like the tresillo, the, the son clave is actually five perfectly placed over 16 beats with compensating for moving it to the nearest beat. So uh, this is a concept of maximal evenness, um, which uh, from a psychological standpoint it makes sense that you feel things and try to move things in a way that maximizes your attention. We're not going to talk too much about that. Um, but just to, just to really make sure that you understand uh, rhythmic divisions uh, and how expectations work, um, it's mainly just, yeah, I guess the slide should have been earlier. Uh, this is really just to show that inside of bigger rhythms, tinier rhythms exist. It's just important uh, to understand that concept. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the expressive power of microtime. Uh, because, you know, you can just be like, that's cool, microtiming, you can change notes on an individual level. But to some genres of music, it's, that, that's all that it is. Like, that part is so important, and it actually is super complex. And uh, for hip-hop in particular, because they have lots of electronic sounds, they, they spend like hours and hours just shifting samples, like, by milliseconds to get this right feel. Um, and I personally believe that DAWs and things have been programmed with a certain type of music in mind, and that I think we need to we need to update our rhythmic vocabulary, especially in the digital world, because it's possible, in order to incorporate the needs of artists and what things are happening. Um, and we see um, the book that got me into the circles, uh, written by Justin London. He actually came to the University of Edinburgh. Uh, because somebody was challenging his theories about the circles based on Western or Sudanese music. And he was like, well, let's see. And he actually revised his theories um, based on this genre of music because it, it didn't encapsulate perfectly. Because in this genre of music, uh, the beats are not always exact and they're temporal dependent. And it's not even, it is the specific beats. Uh, like you can't just put an equation over like everything to move them around because certain beats, there's more uncertainty as to where they're gonna fall. Like beat three might be here or here, but beat one is always gonna be where beat one is. So if you move everything over a bit, it doesn't, it loses the whole feel because it's only certain beats that this type of music would play around with. And it's, it's very similar to hip hop and actually jazz also, where drummers will play around with a skip beat, which is the end of three. And you can totally tell one drummer from another from this one tiny note. But in modern dolls, they just have like apply a swing feel and it does it for everything. Anyway, it's a good room, it's a good room for dolls to grow, um, to try to incorporate uh, this uh, microtiny expression into software systems. So, um, we're going to talk about alternatives to DAWs where you can actually have more expressive microtiming. Most of my work is in Maximus P, which is not free. Everything else that I'm talking about is free. And pure data is essentially the same as Maximus P. Uh, CLM and Slippery Chicken are two projects, or two programs that we have been working in in our digital composition 
uh, of course, if you know C, if you know Lisp, it's great. If you don't, I won't highly recommend them unless <laughs> unless you know Lisp for it. Uh, Super Collider, I swear by it. Um, the Bjorklund fork, in particular, everything I've just talked about is already built in. All every like mathematical maximal evenness and everything is already built into Super Collider in one of the forks. Um, but really, any computer language that you can think of. Uh, including Faust, I'm sure. Uh, you can put in expressive microcode. Uh, okay, so my master's thesis is called Studies and Entrainment, and it's basically using all the concepts I just talked about, but slowly phasing these things in and out of sync. Um, again, I'm only at the micro level, so there's only going to be two things going in and out of sync. But essentially, the point is to make really strong grooves, move them out, and uh, explore between discrete rhythms and actual continuous sound. Um, and to do this, uh, I'm using instead of MIDI sequence stuff, everything is DSP driven. So you can go through data uh, at 440,000, much faster than you can on MIDI. Uh, and when you put and when you want a placement to be on a note level, you can't always subdivide and use a global clock to be, well, let's quantize to 16th notes. But DSP driven stuff allows you to really finely tune where every single note is. Um, and I firmly believe that, and it's psychology I believe that, uh, you're going to retain the structures, the higher order structures uh, in which you're working with, regardless of whether they're suddenly out. You will perceive those things, but Collectively, you'll, you'll associate these things together because human beings just perceive like sounding things together. Uh, and phasing and phase alignment uh, is something that was really big in minimalism and classical music. Uh, and I, I make use of it in both, um, in both the really fast scale and the smaller scales and the really small scales. Uh, but the getting back into sync once everything is out is what entrainment is, and it's used a lot in medicine and physics. Uh, so in Max, uh, this object, which I had no idea existed until two months ago, called rate tilde, it just allows you to be phaser, when you're using a phaser uh, and DSP to drive sequences, this proportionally moves the phaser while still having phase locking things. So if you want both of the both of the sequences to lock together after a certain amount of time, you can do that with Ray Tilda. Uh, but the map in order to get two phasers actually locked together is, is really complicated. Uh, I'm sure it's not that complicated if you guys don't know what it is, but I don't. Um, and I've decided to use touchscreen technology just because I personally think the separation from the computer is very beneficial when you are uh, composing and performing. Um, it takes you out of your comfort zone, uh, and it changes, it makes, it really brings you into a different place when you're coding, and then you can be performing in a different situation. And then you can modify, go back to coding, and you can perform. And it's just a totally different mindset, which I found has been much more beneficial. And if you are, if you want to incorporate somebody who's not a computer genius, pretty much everybody knows how to use an iPhone and an iPad at this point, including four-year-olds. Um, so in Max, I'm using Mira, which is a free app. Really, like, you just drag a frame over it, and now you can use most of the, or a lot of the objects on your iPad. Um, so it connects over Wi-Fi. So again, it's just one less cable that you can deal with, and it's pretty reliable. Um, and just for an example, this is what my patch looks like. Uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of <laughs> um, I'm generating, I'm generating these objects from, uh, from a JavaScript thing. And there's really no other way that you can do it without so many cables. It's just, that's just how Max is. Um, but when you load this onto an iPad, it looks much prettier. <laughs> and it definitely makes you want to touch it more. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to touch that. <laughs> so, so JavaScript and Max is really powerful because it can just talk to, it can talk to Max itself. So now instead of like making objects, you just tell JavaScript what objects you want to make and it makes it for you. You can change things that you wouldn't be able to change just with, like on the fly that you could change in the Max. So in that way you can have more creativity that you couldn't have before in just Max. Um, so some examples 
because I'm working with different types of circles, um, I still only have the three phases set up. Measure that other ones. Yeah, you can have three phases with four groups, or three phases with ten events, or three phases with sixteen events, and you can have those pre-programmed. Uh, the micro timing is left and right, and a parameter of one and two is up and down. So much. X is always going to be micro timing. Uh, so if eventually I want to have two or three of these circles going simultaneously. Uh, I just have to have to build the macro system still to to control these things. So I'm gonna I'm starting on that now, and hopefully it'll be ready by August. But you'll hear me perform on the micro system, which I think it sounds pretty good still. Um, so yeah, that's it. So if you have any questions. repetition of the same material is necessarily bad, and I think it is something that is desirable in music, in many forms of music, in music that I enjoy. Yeah. So do you change the speed of the... Repetition? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh, cool. uh, and you can change the direction also. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's sort of thing to what we were talking about after Cameron's talk. You said one of the things means that you have much easier interactivity for non-musicians and other people who you know, mm -hmm. programming or music either. Yeah. Uh, like, do you think that this kind of like ease of interactivity would make it more or less like accessible for people in the style we were talking about before? You know, where you see somebody doing something and you don't see any of the the back end of it. You don't see what's going on. Do you think people are gonna kind of appreciate that more, or do you think it'll be like they'll be like, oh well, yeah, but it's there's no kind of I mean, you know, it's, it's, like, it's, it's the rigor, performance, maybe. like, if I build something that's easy to use, and I give it to you, and you can yeah. use it, like, does that mean you can use it better than me? And if you can use it better than me, that's, that's awesome, I'm all about that. Like, there's, there are some things where, like, you know, proprietary software, where it's like, I built this, and it's complicated, and you can't use it because it's complicated. But if you want to play with people, it's, it's much more social, and I find social things to be more important, to be an important element to music. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you said that you don't consider it so much to be what you're aiming for, whether or not people are considering whether it's like a, a I don't know whether people are going to be like, he's an excellent musician, just want it to be a kind of interaction between people. Uh, I guess more if, if people want to do micro timing in their music, this would be a tool that they could use for that. Yeah. Uh, Really, but I mean, like in in Super Collider, you can do the same things, but you have to be basically a programmer. You have to understand that this is nested inside of this, which is going to a node, which is connected to a server, which is going to a global tempo clock, and this one number control. There's no graphic user interface. Where this has like a very friendly. I've tried to make it a friendly graphic user interface, where you see these lights going around, and you see like a, a step sequencer is very. I think it's user friendly. Like. You see the lights going, and you can tell that they're corresponding to events. But you don't see that with a lot of uh, text-based uh, languages, which, which come from early computer people just hating GUIs, I think. I think they just <laughs> laughed at them, which I think is slowly changing. I don't know. I don't know. It still has lots of room. It's another Negro Ponte thing where he talks about that. Like, when he was working at MIT, literally there was a movie department where people just made fun of them. Like they were like the nerds of the nerds. Which <laughs> is a shame, but it's okay. Now we're stuck with like still like crouched over here. I just think touchscreen stuff is a good it's the beginning of like 
Oh yeah, it goes over here while I'm walking around. Yeah. And I, I like yeah. it. Yes. Um, being a talented bass player yourself, yeah. um, have you considered bringing your bass in, maybe on top of what you're doing? Like you could be launching these different groups yeah. and then kind of improvising on top of things? Or yeah, I, I, I've done a lot of collaborations that failed. Um, or we're not as good as I would have liked. So I definitely am trying to gear stuff that's more towards like individual performance. And uh, once the macro stuff is developed and I can just, there can be an automated sequence, like I generate the stuff in a sequence or fashion, but then I can click a button and the macro controls slowly move over, and that's the time that I can be playing the bass. So that, that is a, a thing that's crossed my head, but performing with Cameron, like having one extra musician, I think really, really aids a lot. Uh, but I try to make it so it's, it's, it has options to be by itself or with one other person. Anyway. Yeah. In a lot of contexts where you might be exploring micro timing in music, you might be playing with a lot of other people and at least have a lot of different compositional elements which might not necessarily follow one strict kind of to and fro of micro timing around the given pulse. Mm -hmm. The patch you've built that deals with one particular sound at once, or can it handle multiple sounds and then have different kind of applications of different extents of micro timing fluctuation for different elements. Yeah. So if you're in like a, a group or something and you're playing with like the keys player and like the, the kit player and the bass player to kind of like put it in a context which is comprehensible. Yeah. Um, they might all be kind of playing some kind of like micro timing fluctuation around the beat but it's not necessarily consistent with one another. Mm -hmm. So is that something you kind of like sought to address yeah. in what yeah. you're doing? I have the option that would be, I mean, there's, there's just so many levels. Like, if you have yeah. two sequences going, if they're, like, going to line up, then they're always going to be, like, you're going to hear the same structure over and over again. But if they're out of phase, but they're still structuring themselves, then you have two things that are happening, but they're slowly getting out of sync with each other. I thought about putting the option of, like, certain ones can, certain instruments, there's discrepancy where other ones are right on. But for this version, it is just kind of, I mean, it's it's static, but again, I want repetition. I want you to be able to hear the micro timing. It's it's kind of a waste to spend a lot of time on the rhythm parts if you're just going to hear it once, which I think is a, another problem with non-beat-based music, like classical music, for example, where there is repetition, but it's a much bigger form versus funk music, where the drum will be playing the same thing over and over again. There has to be micro inflections or it's boring. And yet, it's just as engaging. Yeah, it can be. Uh, I think. Great. Yeah. Uh, I can play a demo of well, I Cameron and I should just perform. That'd be good. Yes, please do. Next up is Cameron and I, two guys with beards. 